I had that strength to realize, okay, there's no need, you don't need to rely on food to hide the pain. You just have to face the pain of what happened. And that's when I realized that, wait a minute, how many other people out there are facing the same thing? And then I remembered you aren't alone. And then it made it less scary. Mm -hmm. Then I realized, oh, okay, I'm not the only one because we feel sometimes that we're isolated. Welcome back to Happiness in Progress. I'm your host, Danielle Craig. I'm an Emmy award-winning journalist, a mom, wife, and you know what I like to say, just a person looking for more joy in the everyday. This podcast is brought to you by the Mail Tribune. You can find more podcasts at mailtribune.com. Have you heard? I have just released the Hip Habits Workbook, the Happiness in Progress Habits Workbook. It is six months with weekly goals, everything from financial health to physical health and mental health. It's all in this workbook to give you really tangible tools and helpful things that can improve your life in just a week's time. Trying out new habits and giving yourself faith in your ability to accomplish small things. Now let's get to today's guest. You are going to be hearing from Lydia Bordeaux. I'm so excited to share this conversation with you. Lydia is a mom, wife, domestic violence survivor, and recently she's gained attention nationally for losing 31 pounds. In this journey she shared on social media, she really is authentic and real. She's focused on finding the positive within everything she does and bettering herself every time she gets to work on those workouts. In this conversation, we talk about the journey of the weight loss and what that did, not only physically, but internally, Uh, what she's learned about herself, how some of this has helped her heal from the domestic violence that she has gone through. And you'll learn about how... If she can do it, you can do it. I think that's really her message. And I I just love what she has to say. If you're looking for a conversation in the early beginning of the year to to find the faith in yourself and, and believe in yourself, I think this is it. So let's get to it. Thank you so much, Lydia, for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I'm so excited because I've watched your journey through weight loss and it has been really inspiring. And I love how authentic you are and how you always show up for yourself and and for Mm -hmm. others. I think it's incredible. So tell me a little bit about when that weight loss journey started. So it really started on actually right before my 34th birthday, I was getting ready to graduate from the university of Texas at Dallas with my degree. And I finally realized, okay, now it's time where I can focus on me again. Mm -hmm. You know, this weird concept that we go through as moms of, we feel like we have to put everyone ahead for their needs instead of our own. But then I realized I have to start taking care of myself. And we had our Peloton. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to create a year long goal for myself. I'm not going to do new year's resolution. We're going to do a birthday resolution. So I came up with the 300 rides because at that time that was going to be a major push for myself. And it just kind of coincided with graduation, kind of entering this new phase and just everything. And it was actually the best decision that I have ever made. And I'm so glad that I made it. It was I, I never imagined it would grow into what it has. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's been what, one of the things, I mean, of course we, we, if we go on your Instagram, we can see the before and afters and, and mm-hmm. you look amazing and you can tell that you feel amazing. One of my favorite before and afters though, was the background of the room and the before it was dirty and the after it was like all tidied <laughs> up and your bed was made. And there was more of just a physical transformation. Tell me about the, the internal transformation that, that it, has occurred. It was one of those things. I actually, it was a couple of weeks ago, I believe I posted that picture and it was really kind of a huge, it was really some um, symbolic of my life. You know, at the time when I started that my whole like internal life was still basically a massive disaster. I was still trying to kind of figure out, you know, who am I? What is it that I want for myself entering, you know, this next chapter, my daughter's getting older, getting ready to go to middle school. So she doesn't need me as much. And just kind of that dilemma that you face as a mom Mm -hmm. and you know, who am I? That was the biggest thing. And I saw that huge mess when I posted it, I'm like, Oh my God, my room was messy. Now it's clean. I'm starting to figure (laughs) out who I am. It's like, I'm an adult now. This is great. Um, but that was really the biggest thing 
is I realized, wait a minute, this is how I've grown over the past year. Not only is my space clean, fantastic, you know, this is great, but my internal, I, I have that organized drive to stay focused every day towards that goal of, you know, whatever it might be. Like right now I've changed to marathon, which I'm sure we'll get to here in a little bit, but it's really having something to work towards where I felt like before I was kind of floundering and didn't really have that purpose. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think a huge part of why I was just kind of out there and not really being seen or heard before, especially for myself. I just didn't really feel like I had a purpose or a huge reason just to have anything. And that's how I feel like a lot of moms feel right now of just, we're kind of there. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. And I was just kind of, I was tired of feeling like that. Mm -hmm. I just hit that point. The amazing thing to me is that you've done all this during the pandemic. Yes. How were you able, how do you think sticking to your goal and sticking to those Peloton rides and doing that every day? How do you think that impacted how you've handled this, the pandemic? You know, when we, when the pandemic started, um, I actually remember this when everything started to happen, I was actually in Washington at my parents' house that week. It was my daughter's spring break. It was her birthday. We flew up to see my parents. I'm I'm originally from Washington state. I now live in Dallas. And I remember looking, okay, do I need to change my flight? Because they were getting ready to, yeah, they were getting ready to like shut down flights for Europe. And I was panicking. I was like, oh my God, am I going to be stuck here living with my parents for the next year? That's you know, thought crossed my head of, oh my God, I'm going to have to move back in with mom and dad. What am I going to do? Um, but then I was like, Hey, let's figure it out. I was constantly looking, do we need to change our flight? And then I realized, wait a minute, the only way you are going to get through all of this is if you have a plan. Luckily we didn't have to change our flight because it was a Saturday morning at like, I think 6 30 AM is when we left Portland. But I realized when I got back and they shut everything down here in Dallas and we were working from home, I said, okay, you can either have choose one of two mentalities. You can either find the positive in it, or you can sit there and make the worst of the situation. Which one are you going to do? So I opted to create, try to kind of replicate a normal routine as best as I could you know, getting up at the same time for work, um, you know, trying to create the normal work day that I did, trying to create a normal workout habit, just trying to keep that routine. And then of course we had to throw in virtual school for my daughter. Oh my gosh. That was, I I never would wish that upon my worst enemy ever again. I am definitely not meant to homeschool this. I know now and teachers are not paid enough, like at (laughs) all. They need their salaries like doubled or tripled. This is just needs to happen. But that's how I've maintained is I made the conscious choice every single day of find something positive in today. Now was every single day unicorns and you know, confetti. No, some days were just plain horrible. I didn't want to get out of bed. I'm thinking, Oh my God, this is horrible. Somebody get me a bottle of wine and that's, we're just going to call it a day. But I realized, wait a minute, there are people out there who are facing far worse than me. I mean, if you see the news, there's constantly video of people waiting in food lines in Dallas and it's heartbreaking. And I realized probably about the first month in when people started sharing their stories with me of your posts, give me the inspiration to get through the day. That's when I realized, wait a minute, if this is a way I can give back to others when they are struggling to just make it through, then this is how I can give back. And that's why I was like, Hey, you have to keep going. You have to keep going for those who need that inspiration right now. And that has been the biggest motivator realizing it's far bigger than me now. It's yeah. about the community that are kind of joining in together and they're buying Pelotons or they're actually starting a weight loss journey or just focusing on those little steps to get healthy. And that came from the decision of, you know, let's just focus on the positive during this pandemic. Let's just focus on day by day maintaining this positive mindset out of what could let's hope it doesn't get worse from here in our (laughs) lifetime 
let's hope, but right. this has been one of the worst parts of our lifetime. And I just, I, if I can be some sort of inspiration to a mom out there who is in her closet crying because she is just exhausted and tired from a day of just everything thrown at her, then that's the least I can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is why I've kept going. Is it hard to be authentic when you are trying to put out those, those positive messages? With me and my posts, what you see is what you get. This is just how I am. There have been life experiences for me to where I have a lot to be grateful for. I'm a 13-year domestic violence survivor to where I I choose every day to view it as, you know, 13 years ago, I very well could, if something had been different, I may not be alive right now. So I choose to live every day of finding the positive in a situation because I view it as a gift to be here. Mm -hmm. So for me, finding the positive and choosing to be authentic and just be real, that's me. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't edit my photos. I don't do the facial blur. I don't do any of those filters. That's not who I am. And the last thing I want is for a mom who is maybe starting her journey and she sees me and it's, I could be a pot, like an edited photo. I don't want her to be discouraged because she thinks it's edited. It's not, it's hard work. So I try to be authentic to kind of just realize, wait a minute, she's a mom. She's busy. She's working full time. She's got a kid. If she can do it, I can do it too. So having the life experience of the past with now and merging them together it's just a choice every day to continue to be just true to myself. And if you don't like it, oh, well, there's plenty <laughs> of other Instagram people you can follow. And that's just really my mindset of this is my channel. This is my outlet. And this is me. Take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that you do that for people because there's so little that's not filtered. In fact, I just recently within the last month was like, I'm not using filters anymore on my, I was using like this eyelash filter, you know, the whole thing. And I'm like, I'm not, I can't do that anymore to myself or to the other people who are here. Um, okay. So let's, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the, the domestic violence and how you are a survivor and what healing has occurred within the last year, because I, you've lost all this weight and you look incredible, but I know that there's a before and after that we can't see the internal before and after. Tell me a little bit about the healing that has occurred. So it took honestly about 11 and a half years to even acknowledge it. There was a time where the shame was there and I didn't even want to acknowledge what had happened. And that was really the start of my dependence on food, especially when it came to eating my emotions. Mm -hmm. At the time, you know, obviously being in my early twenties, we do drink a lot, especially in a college town. That's kind of what <laughs> happens. Um, but I, it was really kind of food and wine were the two that I relied on. Well, obviously kind of wine pulled back as I got older, but the food was still there instead of, you know, focusing on, wait a minute, why am I sitting here watching a Hallmark movie, binge eating this bag of Oreos instead of putting them down? It was like those little things. I didn't realize what I was doing. But then kind of working through the process and acknowledging what happened, you know, being able to face it and understand it wasn't me. It was his actions. It was his issues and kind of facing back some of the memories and realizing, okay, you did everything you had to do in a smart way. You know, it took eight months for me to develop a safety plan to safely leave, mm. realizing, okay, you do everything that you did. You did it right. You are alive now. I am married to the best guy who is so supportive of everything. And he's like, if you want to talk about it, you can, if just when you're ready, he doesn't push it. He doesn't, you know, bring stuff up. He's just like, when you want to talk, we will. But with eating, when I realized that, okay, this is here. This is why I'm do, I have this dependence on food because I'm trying to kind of shut up those emotions and the shame. 
when I face that is when I have that strength to realize, okay, there's no need, you don't need to rely on food to hide the pain. You just have to face the pain of what happened. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized that, wait a minute, how many other people out there are facing the same thing? And then I remembered you aren't alone. And then it made it less scary. Mm -hmm. Then I realized, oh, okay. I'm not the only one because we feel sometimes we're, we're isolated. Mm -hmm. And we are kind of, you know, on this Island by ourselves, and there's no escape, but then we realize, oh, wait a minute. It's like one in four. Oh, she is, or he is. And then it kind of grows. And then the shame kind of disappears when that happened. Then I was able to safely let myself kind of face those past experiences. And then I started to realize, okay, Let's work on, you have this moment, or if it's a trigger of something, don't turn to food. And that's when I got on the bike. Mm -hmm. Anytime there was a trigger, I made the conscious decision. Instead of grabbing the bag of Oreos or the bag of chips, I got on the bike and I did a 20 minute ride. Or I went to Ali Loves Sundays with Love. I can't even tell you how many times I just started sobbing on that bike. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was there for. So for me, it all kind of goes hand in hand. And one of the other things that came with weight loss is every pound I lost felt like a pound of baggage from that abuse that I had let go. Wow. That to me is just, it's, it's that freeing experience to just, okay, it's gone. That wasn't you, but you are stronger for it. And I I can honestly say now in a weird sort of way, I'm thankful for it because it's made me stronger and it's made me who I am today. Mm. It's made me resilient. It's made me positive. It's made me focused on the good things that I do have. And those are things I wouldn't trade for anything. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think you gave yourself the strength. I think you found your strength. That's pretty incredible. Tell me about facing those emotions on the bike. What is that? What is that like? Um, it's, it's the weirdest feeling. It's when I, I could just sense of like, it's been a hard day and it's, you're on the brink of tears and I would just get on the bike and it could be a random song. Like one of the, I remember this, ride. It was the greatest showman ride. And it was the song, This Is Me. That song, because last year it was my theme song for 2020. Every year I have a theme song and this year is no different. So last year it was, This Is Me. And it was kind of that, you know, accepting of this is who I am. And that song came on and it was just this flood of emotion. And here I am sobbing on the bike all of just this release of everything, mascara, you know, running down my face. I probably look like Alice Cooper at that point. (laughs) I mean, it was a hot mess, but it was so freeing. And I got off the bike and it was just like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. Mm. And it was just one of the best experiences. And to me, that's why I was like, I realized, wait a minute. Anytime you feel like this, just get it out on the bike. If you feel like you're going to you know, burst out crying, either put on your running shoes, get your butt out running or get your butt on the bike. Mm-hmm. One of those two things. And then it, you get it out. And that has been difficult at times, but so needed. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's been a lot of women who've had the similar experiences. That's what I was going to ask next. If someone's listening and they're like, you know, I'm, I'm s- still in phase, eat all the Oreos on the couch when I'm having those feelings I don't want to face. What's the advice you would give them? One, give yourself time. Mm-hmm. I mean, it took me over an 11 and a half years to face it. It's not a quick timeline of, okay, you have 18 months to face this. No. You have to give yourself as much time as you need until you are ready to face what you went through. And you almost hit this point of, okay, I'm ready to make these changes now. I'm ready to focus on me and let go. And that's really where it had come to for me. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, just focus on those little changes 
focus on a mini goal that week. And that's how I started. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if it's, if they're struggling and they don't have a Peloton or they don't have a treadmill and just, you know, if they're facing a kind of similar thing of, I don't want to pick up the Oreos. I don't want to do all of this, but what do I keep doing? Okay. Find a podcast, put on your running shoes, go walk a couple times around the block, focus on doing something to, you know, kind of replace the eating habit. That's what I did. It was hard the first couple dozen times. It was very hard, but then it got easier. Mm -hmm. And then it, it was kind of one of those things that got less and less scary. And then it was kind of like, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. That -hmm. was, that was a big one. That's amazing. That's really amazing. Um, What's your song for 2021? Um, It's well, it's kind of the Whitney Houston. um, I didn't know my own strength. This, my song, my word of the year, or yeah, my word of the year is strength. Everything is based around strength because I know that for 2021, we are going to have to keep being strong. You know, we're going to be entering our second year of all of this. I'm going to be working from home at least until June, probably. So nothing's really going to change for right now. So you still have to be strong to get through each day. And that's why I opted to keep focusing on finding more and more of my strength that Mm -hmm. I have hidden deep down in the back of my closet for many, many years and just keep finding that. And I'm just, I'm ready. I'm ready for the next phase. I love that. I love that. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but number for day one, day one, Lydia, if she could see you today, what is she, what is she thinking? What is she amazed by shocked by what, what is on her mind? I, how did you keep it off? Mm. How did you not give up and go back to, you know, this kind of yo-yo? How did you keep persisting through instead of giving up after day 60? Mm -hmm. I think that would be the biggest thing. So many times we feel like we stumble for a couple of weeks and then we're just like, I I can't go back. I I just, I got to give up, but that's not the case. And I've realized that it's okay to stumble. It's okay to crash and burn your wagon and have it fall upside down in a creek. It that's okay. You just got to rebuild it, put it back up on the road and keep going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is the biggest thing. And I love that on Instagram, you share the weeks when you gain a few pounds, you share the weeks where you're like, I'm not going to weigh myself this week because I'm having some, you know, mental issues with the number. Um, I, I love that you do that. Um, How do you set the, before I ask the next, how do you set the boundaries with the scale? Because the number on the scale can be a huge, huge um, triggering issue for people. It can really impact their mental health. Yes. So, I mean, right now I'm kind of in that whole mental hatred with the scale right now, um, because since I started marathon training, I'm running a lot more. So I still have those micro tears and everything is kind of filled with water and I've gained the normal three to five pounds from beginning to run it a lot again. So right now I'm just like, okay, you know what? Step off the scale. Don't even worry about it. Give it a couple of weeks. And I realized that it's not a permanent weight gain, but the weight gain is still there. So mm-hmm. I don't even want to acknowledge that. And that's where I've realized, okay, why am I letting a machine that tells me my gravity pull. Yes. Dictate. Your, your body mass is relation to gravity. It's so dumb. It's like, why am I letting a machine that tells me my gravity pull dictate my self-worth? That is the stupidest thing I have ever seen and heard. And I'm just like, why am I doing that? And I'm, re- I was reminded of that in, um, I don't know if you've ever watched on Netflix, David Letterman's interviews, mm-hmm. but he interviewed Lizzo and Oh my gosh, I love her because she was kind of discussing the same thing. And I was just like, she's, she's the best thing ever. And when it comes to weight and everything she owns, where she basically tells people kind of go screw themselves and just, she owns it. She goes, I am beautiful. This is who I am. And that to me is, I wish more women felt like that of, no matter what you look like, no matter what you weigh, you are absolutely beautiful. 
Mm-hmm. And don't let anyone or any airbrushed magazine or any Abercrombie ad tell you differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. And that is why when I go around Target and I see the different ads now where they have a variety of, you know, size of models, I am so happy that they're doing that. Mm-hmm. We you didn't know, have come, that when we were younger. We, yeah. No, we, what did we have? We had nineties diet culture and yeah, exactly. We had, <laughs> you know, size zero, zero, what was it? Cocaine skinny. Yeah. You know, that hole where you had to be so, and then it kind of created this distortion of, we thought what we thought was that ideal that has actually kind of carried into our thirties. Mm-hmm. We were not there. able. Yes. And now we are still kind of struggling with that but they didn't tell us, wait a minute, this is what you're going to look like after you have kids. And, oh, wait a minute, after your metabolism slows down. So I wish that they would do a where are they now type of (laughs) modeling campaign (laughs) um, where they don't airbrush, Yeah, you know, where they show the nice tiger stripes. That's what I call stretch marks. They're your tiger stripes. Um, That's that's what they should do because mm-hmm. yes, the early two thousands, late nineties completely distorted my view on, and I'm sure so many people on what healthy weight and healthy body image should be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 100%. Okay. So new goals for 2021, you're continuing to push yourself. Tell me a little bit about this, pushing yourself into, have you ever run a marathon before? I did. Okay. So I ran the 2019 Dallas marathon. Uh, it was two days before I graduated with my degree Mm -hmm. and I started that whole marathon. I I just went into it in the most botched way ever. I did not train at all. Like at all. I was riding the bike. (laughs) I was riding the bike. Um, but I was not running. I think I'd run six times prior to that. Oh my God. I did not there. I had no business doing that marathon, but I was so determined to do it because it was a goal I had set for myself when I was a teenager of in your lifetime, run a marathon to finish a marathon. And for me, that one was extra special because it was the 30 year anniversary of my dad running the Portland marathon. So mm-hmm. I was like, I have to, I have to do it. it has to be, it has to be 2019 because he ran in 1989 And I did it. I finished in barely, but I did it. And, um, I signed up again for the, the 50th, it was supposed to be, you know, December of 2020 Dallas marathon, but they moved it to May in 2021. So I'm doing that one. And I also COVID pending cross my fingers. Let's hope I can do the Portland marathon in October. How does making these goals, um, keep you on that track of, of the, the strength journey, the journey of who you are as a person? For me, it's constantly finding something that is going to keep pushing me to a new level, uh, for running. It's why I love running so much is because you can only rely on yourself. Mm -hmm. It's you everything. It's you having the determination to get out there and put in the work that nobody else sees to put in those miles and those steps when it is 30 degrees raining and nobody else is out there. So it's having that constant discipline to just keep going and working towards that end goal. And for me, it carries over into my professional life. And that's what I've noticed. These Peloton goals have carried over professionally and it allows me to approach my work in the same sort of way of having that. So it all ties together of a bigger picture to where it's not just this tiny, tiny little, you know, fitness health goal. No, it's now a huge, massive personal, Mm -hmm. every aspect of my being. Mm -hmm. So that's really how I've noticed the change of what this has done. And of course, you know, being at home and not having the time for commute and kind of de-stress, it allows me to do that. 
it allows me to go out and run three miles or five miles or whatever, and then kind of have that de-stress time, that time for myself, the time to get any sort of stress or just anything from the day off my chest. And then I'm like, okay, we're good. We can start fresh mm-hmm. tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So that's really the big thing about exercise that I love. Oh, me too. I love, I love running. That's what running is to me. I love it. Um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm going to ask you one last question, which is what I ask everyone. Um, the podcast is about finding more joy in the everyday, the good, the bad, and the in-between. What is your number one tip to doing that? Finding more joy in the everyday. Oh, even when you are going through what could be the worst situation of your life, and the absolute worst thing ever. And I'm going to click and tell this story because there's a reason behind it. Uh, 20, it was 2012. My husband actually was almost killed on the job. Mm. And in Seattle, he fell through a roof over 20 feet. Mm. And at that time, I thought it was going to absolutely break me. I wasn't, I, it took me about two years cause I had to focus on helping everybody else kind of get through him, you know, get walking through physical therapy again, uh, helping my daughter. Cause she was, you know, a couple weeks short of shy of turning two. all of that. Had that not have happened, we would not have had the opportunity to move to Texas. I would have not had the opportunity to go to the school that I did. I would have not have had the opportunity to have landed the job that I have. I would have not had the opportunity to work for the amazing boss that I have now. So that one horrible incident led to some of the biggest life blessings that I have ever had. So even when we think that it's the absolute worst thing, it's going to break us. We think we're just going to not make it through even though it's horrible and it's sad and it's going to be emotionally and physically trying down the road, it could not be in a weird sort of twisted way, be one of the biggest blessings in your life because it can open you up to something greater. Mm-hmm. So every day, and I, I, my thing right now for people struggling to find, you know, say they lost their job, my thing is, okay, one, I am so sorry if you've lost your job during this pandemic, Be a, you know, if you have kids, that to me is just, it breaks my heart and it's so sad. And if there's some way that we can help people make sure that they have food still on their table, that is something that needs to be addressed, obviously, and that needs to happen. But I hope it allows a door open to them where they can get a bit a better paying job. That is something that I sincerely hope for all people, that they can get something that will make them happier. It'll be better paying. They will have more time at home. That is something that I hope that can come out of this. And for all of these situations, that people can start finding joy again in some of these dark moments that we're all facing right now. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's such beautiful advice. That is every day. I know it's horrible. I, it's okay. You will get through. It may take months or even years, but you will be stronger and you will be better down the road. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You absolutely will. I love that. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure getting to talk to you. I hope you loved hearing from Lydia. Of course, I always link my guests information. I really suggest following her on social media. I love that she doesn't use filters. I love that she's super real. That's what you're going to get when you follow her. I'll put that in the show notes. And I want to thank you for being here on happiness and progress.